Thank you for the introduction, Alison. Um, my name is Barry, Barry Morris, and I'm a senior lecturer in biochemistry here at Loughborough University. And my research specialism really is in exercise oncology. I kind of actually span two worlds of research. I was in a past life a tumor virologist, so I've got an interest in virus associated cancers. And that really got me into sort of cell biology and particularly what governs cancer metastasis, what makes cancer spread. Um, and when I moved to Loughborough in 2017, I was strongly encouraged to find a sport and or exercise angle for my research. And it opened up a whole new world for me. Up until that point, I ashamedly had rather naively thought, you know, you get cancer, you take your treatment, either surgery, chemotherapy or both, um, and you're, you're, you're lucky you live. And if not, then, then that's it. But when I started to look into the, the role that exercise plays in preventing cancer, it was like, having my eyes open to a whole new world um, and I've become quite obsessively fan um what's the word also well, obsessively interested in finding out more about how exercise can benefit patients both as a, in a, as a preventative measure but also throughout the whole cancer continuum so that's what we're going to be focusing on um this evening um, so during this session, we're going to look at how our immune system protects us against cancer in the first place, but obviously it does sometimes go wrong. Uh, we're going to look at the importance of exercise along the cancer continuum. <laughs> my, my, sorry, my animations are out of sync. We're going to look at how exercise can help prevent cancer in the first place. Um, and then, like, as I said, how it um, and helps throughout the whole cancer continuum. We'll look at what happens to existing cancers when we exercise. And also, this is part of the new, new stuff that we've added for tonight, how exercise affects the tumour microenvironment. So this is something that my uh, PhD student and some undergraduate and master's students have been working on with me. Um, and then we'll look at the impacts of exercise on immune function, particularly in patients, and we'll finish off with some current recommendations for exercise. So let's start with the immune system. I'm going to give a very a high level overview. I'm trying not to get too technical, but if you want more detail of a course, you can ask questions. So we have um, two arms to our immune system, the non-specific immune system, which is what you're born with. It doesn't change throughout life. And then you have your specific immune system, which is what adapts over time. So the more you meet different viruses and bacteria, your immune system will create a memory and it will remember that, <clears throat> excuse me, that virus or bacteria. So if you ever get infected again, you mount a much faster immune response. But the first line of defense for protecting us against cancer is our non-specific immune system and specifically these natural killer cells. Now I liken natural killer cells to being a bit like Daleks from Doctor Who. It's been many years since I've watched Doctor Who. I used to watch it as a child when it was Sylvester McCoy. That's how old I am. Um, and these NK cells basically circulate through the bloodstream and they're looking for signs of either a rogue cancer cell or a virus infected cell. And when they meet something that they're not sure of, um, they will receive a signal or not to kill them. And this is done, this is mediated through the receptors that are on the surface of your NK cell. So imagine this, I don't even know what it is, it's like a toilet plunger, but imagine this being a receptor. And they have a, either inhibitory receptors or activatory receptors. Now, depending on which receptors are engaged will depend whether the natural killer cell will get that signal to kill its target. So on your normal healthy cells, we have... Um, something called major histocompatibility receptors or complexes. Um, and every cell in the body except your nucleated cells, uh, non-nucleated cells will have these. Um, and these will bind to the inhibitory receptor. So if an NK cell meets a healthy cell and that MHC inhibitory receptor um, handshake happens, then it goes, right, okay, you're safe. I'll, leave, I'll leave you alone. On the other hand though, on our tumor cells, which often lose these MHC receptors, Instead, it's going to engage the activatory receptor on the surface of the NK cell. And this time, the NK cell receives this signal to kill its target, what it's, what it's locked onto. Now, it does so in one of two ways. First, directly um, by secreting granzymes, an enzyme which breaks down the, the cell wall, but also it secretes something called perforins. So these are small molecules that form a ring, they're very, very small, they form a ring. So a bit like if you imagine if you're going, like you do, skydiving, and if you have uh, maybe four or five people who go skydiving together and they can then hold hands and form a ring formation in the air. Well, in a similar way, perforin molecules will form that ring and then they'll land on the surface of the target cell and it effectively creates a little pore. And then that pore is opened up to allow the, these enzymes, these granzymes, to get inside the cell and start to break down um, and just destroy the target cell. 
At the same time, indirectly, these NK cells will themselves release small molecules called cytokines, and those cytokines serve to recruit other cells from this specific immune response, which we'll talk about next. So remember I said your non-specific is what you're born with, it doesn't change, so we all have natural killer cells right from the, the, the day we're born, um, but we don't have very mature specific immune, immunity when we're born. Um, but the cells, the types of immune cells that are important for protecting us against cancer from the specific immune response are your cytotoxic or killer T cells. And then we also have helper T cells and B cells as well. So your T cells, both helper and cytotoxic or killer T cells, these come from an organ which is about the size of your fist and it sits in your sternum, just behind your sternum, um, called, called the thymus. Whereas your B cells, uh, which produce antibodies, these will come from your bone marrow. So this is where they originate from. So when you're born, as I said, you haven't got a very mature immune system and you have to develop that over time. Um, but your uh, T cells come from your thymus, but your thymus actually shrinks as you get older. So when you're born, it starts to grow. And by the time you're about 18 months, two years old, the thymus is the biggest it's ever going to be. And then it starts to shrink. And it uh, roughly, on average, halves in size every 16-ish years. And that rate, it's called thymic involution. And that rate of decline, that rate of shrinkage, is slightly faster in men than it is in women. Um, now, this study came out of the University of Dundee, um, probably about five or six years ago now. Um, and they showed that, four years, there you go, 2018. Uh, they showed that they were able to plot something like 2 million or 4 million cases of cancer um, against thymic involution, and they saw a, a closer uh, correlation with that rate of decline of immune function and the increasing incidence of cancer. And they were actually able to pick apart the differences between a gender as well with age, um, and that's more closely correlated than this, what we call the two-hit hypothesis, which is all about genetic mutations and having two different gen genetic mutations um, to cause cancer in the first place. So they were able to see more of a correlation there than we do with mutation. So we always thought of cancer as a genetic disorder, which it is, because you do need mutations in order to drive cancer, but actually it's also a, a one of immunological control. So we have a very, um, very good, very efficient immune system that protects us from developing many cancers throughout our life. But obviously it's not a perfect system, otherwise cancer wouldn't exist. Now, why does exercise help prevent cancer? Why does it help people who are going through treatment? Why does it help? prevent uh, metastases. Well, I'm going to go through the evidence that we have so far and then some of the mechanisms, but again, quite high level that we know so far. So we know from a study um, in 2016 that um, leisure time physical activity, so this is not necessarily exercise where you're deliberately going out for a run or a jog. This is leisure time physical activity, gardening, housework, walking, that sort of thing, um, reduces the risk of some cancers. So esophageal carcinoma, liver cancer, lung cancer, kidney cancer, cancers of the gastric cardia, endometrial cancer in women, uh, myeloid leukemia and myeloma, which are both types of blood cancer, colon cancer, head and neck cancer, and rectal, bladder and breast as well. So, and actually you'll notice that prostate cancer is missing off this list. I don't know why it is, because actually we also know that it helps protect against prostate cancer too. Um, and the, in terms of how it does so, there are four key ways, four main mechanisms that are at play here. So first of all, a reduction in certain sex hormones, particularly oestrogen in breast cancer survivors. Um, when you exercise, typically that comes along with a little bit of weight loss or a, a reduction in adiposity. So you're losing a little bit of the fat, the visceral fat around the waist. Um, and that these fat cells are a source of oestrogen and oestrogen itself is like a growth factor that drives the growth of the cancer cells. So first of all, exercise helps to lower them. It also regulates our metabolic hormones, so insulin and lowers insulin growth factor one. So again, this is a growth factor that drives the growth of cancers. But what I'm more interested in is, in particular is um, the role that it has in inflammation and adiposity and immune function. So we know that people who have chronic low-grade inflammation are more susceptible to developing cancer. And this is because inflammatory molecules like cytokines are um, growth factors in their own right. So they will, it's almost like having a little, um, like a fire underneath a pot. The more inflammation you have, the or if you put your pot on the hob, the, the higher the heat that it goes. That's what chronic inflammation, the effect that it has, it kind of drives that growth of cancer. 
Um, and as I mentioned, our immune cells are important for helping protect us against cancer. We know that moderate intensity exercise, it doesn't even need to be vigorous intensity exercise, actually increases the number of T cells we have, NK cells that we have, neutrophils, but it also mobilizes these NK cells. So it helps um, patients um, in terms of um, driving that immune function, helping to eliminate rogue cancer cells. So not only is it good for preventing cancer, which we know, but it's also um, good in terms of helping patients as they go through treatments and can help protect them against uh, secondary cancers as well. So let's take this imaginary person here um, at some point in their life, unfortunately, receive a cancer diagnosis. Typically will undergo surgery and or chemotherapy. And if after they've finished their however many rounds of chemotherapy and they are are able to survive for five years beyond the end of treatment, they would then be classed as a cancer survivor. So they fall into the survivorship pool. Um, unfortunately, secondary cancers or secondary tumours can arise. Um, and we don't know, well, we know some, some reasons why these come back, but there's no kind of set uh, definition of how long it will take before a secondary occurs. It could be a few years or it could be many, many years down the line. Um, but typically these secondary tumours are much more aggressive, much harder to treat. They are more chemo resistant um, and therefore um, often lead to death. In fact, 90% of cancer related deaths are caused by that secondary tumour and not the primary tumour itself. So in terms of exercise, it can help reduce risk in the first place. It helps prevent you from getting cancer in the first place. If a patient is asked to undergo exercise before and or during chemotherapy, it can actually improve their response to chemotherapy. It can help them improve their recovery, particularly post-surgery recovery as well. It can also help get them fit for surgery and fit for treatment. Um, and we, we think it does reduce secondary risk, although this is a bit more difficult to um, investigate because obviously how long you know, our studies could, could, you could be taking a longitudinal study out to 20 years to be able to capture everyone. But it does look, it does appear to prevent secondary risk. And actually, logically speaking, if it prevents primary, then why wouldn't it prevent secondary? Um, so this is a, uh, the results from, or part of the results from a meta-analysis and systematic review that one of my extremely talented students, his name's Jonathan, um, he's doing his master's, an integrated master's course with us, <clears throat> excuse me. And in his third year project, because of COVID lockdown, our lab-based projects were, um, postponed and so he did a systematic review and meta-analysis and he looked at the combination of resistance exercise and endurance exercise interventions on a whole host of factors so global fatigue is one where we saw significant long-lasting improvements but there was also benefits to uh, things like uh, cardiorespiratory fitness and uh, muscle st structure and function um, depression anxiety and um, um, Oh, quality of life, couldn't remember the last one there. Uh, and so hey, what he saw, what I want to point out here is this is what you're looking at. See this line down the middle? If these dots land on the right of the line, it means there's an improvement. If the dots land on the left of the line, there's a slight decrease in, in, in quality, uh, in global fatigue, um, or rather, sorry, an increase in global fatigue. So what we're seeing is overall, we're getting um, from, from each of these papers that were investigated, we're seeing an improvement in the global fatigue in breast cancer patients. And as I said, there, these are, this was significant, but the other um, side effects were also improved by the two. So individually, resistance and endurance interventions could improve these side effects, but non-significantly. But overall, we see that resistance interventions had the, the best benefits for patients. So what happens to existing cancers when we exercise? So this is a study that comes out of a, a Danish group um, where they took some mice and put them into two different groups. And the group, one group of mice were given access to a running wheel. They didn't have to use it, but behaviorally that's what they do. So they did, hence the word voluntary. And the other group didn't have access to this, this running wheel. And then they were inoculated with tumors. And you can see those that had access to exercise had much slower growth of the tumours than those that already that didn't have access to the running wheel. And you can see that significance here, the massive reduction. So you would think, great, well, what happens if you had a tumour to begin with and then exercise, does it reduce that? But sadly not. And that's the case in mice or in humans as well. 
So exercise may not shrink the size of an exi existing tumour, but it can help slow the growth, which obviously is beneficial. Um, we can then take this into the laboratory, into an, what we call in vitro, so in the lab in the tissue culture dishes, and we take cancer cells and you incubate them with exercise serum. And then when you inoculate these into, it's called nude mouse, but it's basically a mouse that has no immune system. So it's got no thymus, so it produces no T cells. And you get the, the so this is normal serum and you get the growth of more new tumors. But when you bathe them with exercise serum, you get far fewer tumors growing. So there's clearly something that is secreted in the blood of people who exercise that is helping to slow the growth and prevent this formation of new tumors. Now, <coughs> excuse me, this then, well, well, again, probably triggered by COVID because we were stuck, we had to stop our lab uh, research for a little while but during sort of May to June 2020. And so this was the work of my PhD student, MJ Brown, um, another super talented student. And she did, conducted a meta-analysis and systematic review again, looking at this time, the effects of exercise on breast cancer cell uh, viability, growth, and the, the ability to form tumors in the lab, in, in a dish. And we see a reduction in cell migration and cancer cell migration, a, a lot of reduction in cancer cell viability, which means they didn't live so well, and uh, a reduction in proliferation, so a reduction in growth. So these are all things that are characteristic of cancer cells. Um, clearly, increased migration would help a cancer to spread, viability, they just continue to live when they really shouldn't, and proliferation is growth and division. So by exercise, by, by bathing exercise, sorry, by bathing cancer cells in exercise serum in the lab, we see a reduction in each of these parameters. Um, so this was published last year. Then what about in patients? So that's great and nice, great in, in, in the lab, but what about in patients? Well, it's harder to do the studies, clearly. It's, there are ethical issues here, um, but we can look, um, and also we're all very different. So what if I was to go out and run a mile and somebody else in this room was to do the same, we would produce, there would be some similarities with the factors that we produce, but we would have different responses. But overall, it appears that when patients um, undergo exercise before and during chemotherapy, they actually have uh, an increase in the vasculature, which helps to make the treatment more effective. So this on the left hand side is what that's like a diagrammatic representation of what your vessels, your blood vessels would look like in the tissue. And if you took a cross section of that, you can see it's a nice round, um, evenly uh, structured vessel. So you've got these this endothelial cell is a type of cell that lines your blood vessels. Then around that, you've got some basement membrane. And then around that, you've got some vascular smooth muscle cells. And that's obviously what helps they will expand and contract. And that's what helps pump the blood through the vessel. When a tumour begins to grow, if you imagine what's going to happen here, you've got, oh, I haven't got my little tumours at home anymore. Never mind. If you imagine a bunch of grapes, right? Uh, the grapes in the centre, or the cells in the centre, don't have access to any blood vessels in, at first. So they have no oxygen and they have no nutrients. We call this hypoxia. Now, tumour cells can survive for a little while without them, whereas your healthy tissue would just die. But eventually they're going to need to grow their own blood vessels. And so they do so. And this process is called angiogenesis. But they do it in a bit of a rush. So they do a very hasty job of it. And as a consequence, the blood vessels are really leaky. So you can see here the endothelial cells aren't meeting one another. There's fewer... Um, smooth muscle cells around the outside as well. And so any chemotherapy that is treated, uh, given to the patient when it comes through these blood vessels, it just kind of leaks out the outside and also doesn't really get into the center of the tumor. Whereas patients who exercise, it tends to make their vasculature more like this inside the tumor and therefore you can get um, better treatment with the, the chemotherapy drug. Um, also, <clears throat> this is more anecdotal than, um, I haven't got a, a diagram for this, but people who are undergoing exercise seem to be able to withstand higher doses. Not sure why that is. Um, it could be just a simple thing of improving their quality of life and um, reducing depression, for example. And so they're, they feel stronger and therefore are able to withstand higher doses. But there you go. If you, if you do undergo uh, exercise during uh, chemotherapy, then you can withstand higher doses as well, which is obviously beneficial. 
So what about the tumour microenvironment? So this is what, um, well, what I mean by that is the area locally surrounding that tumour immediately. So within a cancer, you're not going to have just cancer cells. It will have healthy tissue cells as well. You'll have other support cells, like you'll have stem cells and immune cells that all serve to help foster the growth of that tumour. Um, so we have, sorry, we have multiple, uh, mesenchymal stem cells is one of the types of stromal cell we call it but it's a bit like a support cell now the literature sadly about this um is about 50 50 on whether they are pro-tumorigenic or anti-tumorigenic or it seemed to appear this way at first and so we thought great here's another opportunity to do another meta-analysis and this is um, something my phd student is working on at the moment it's been submitted so we'll just hope to get that published in um, but basically she looked at mesenchymal stem cells that are coming from different sources so basically they come from either your dental pulp or inside the bone marrow, or they can come from umbilical cord, um, or adipose tissue is another source of mesenchymal stem cells. And they have the ability to support or prevent the growth of tumours. So we did a meta-analysis, and what we found was that no matter which source, the human mesenchymal stem cells actually enhanced the migration and invasion of the breast cancer cell lines in vitro. So again, this is not in people, this is taken back into an in vitro in the lab in tissue culture plates kind of setting, but it would appear that overall mesenchymal stem cells tend to be kind of pro-tumorigenic. So we're currently conducting a study at the moment to determine whether exercise can help prevent mesenchymal stem cell induced breast cancer cell migration and invasion. So we have recruited I say 12 participants, we've actually lost one. So we've got 11 participants and we're doing uh, three things. So we've got either they do a control, or they do nothing for three hours uh, and then a one week washout and period in between. And then they'll do moderate intensity exercise. So they're cycling for um, an hour at 50% of their maximum VO2, so that maximum intensity. Um, and then another one week washout period, and then they're doing an hour at high intensity. So this is 75% of their maximum intensity. That was pretty exhausting. Even our super fit people were struggling with that one. Um, but these were all trained individuals. And then we took their blood and then we extracted serum from that blood. And then we used that to supplement the tissue culture medium, which we grow our tumor spheroids in, which we're gonna do in the presence and absence of the mesenchymal stem cells. And we'll see whether it impacts on um, or are hoping, we don't know, but we're hoping it might reduce cancer cell migration and invasion. So that's where we're at at the moment with that, but I don't have anything to show you uh, other than what we did a little pilot study a few years back where again, master students did this for me, where they showed that it actually reduced the growth of the spheroids. So if I show you here, particularly if you look at high intensity, uh, this is before the exercise, the blood taken before they started the exercise, and this is the blood's taken after the exercise, and you can see a, a, a shrink, a reduction in the, the rate of that steroid growth. So obviously we now want to see what happens when we co-culture our breast cancer cells with our mesenchymal stem cells in these cultures with exercise serum. Um, so going back to more high level stuff, exercise and immune function in cancer patients and why are we moving towards prescribing movement as a medicine, exercise as medicine. So, as part of our anti-tumor immune response, remember I said we have these NK cells that are that first line of defense, but then you also have killer T cells uh, that come along and, and help clear any rogue cancer cells from the area. We know that from the literature that people who have more NK cells and more killer T cells typically have a better prognosis. And this is because exercise actually mobilizes these immune cells against the tumor cells. NK cells are super sensitive to exercise. So if you um, go out for a run tonight, the first immune cell type to be mobilized following an acute bout of exercise would be your NK cells. Um, so when you exercise, clearly you're gonna stimulate the production of adrenaline and noradrenaline. And these bind to something called beta adrenergic receptors, which we have lots of on the surface of our NK cells. And they have more than any other immune cell type. And so therefore, when you exercise, it is this, this production of adrenaline that will stimulate the mobilization of the NK cells by binding to these beta adrenergic receptors. The patients who participated in just moderate intensity exercise, doesn't need to be high intensity, showed that they had more killing activity of their NK cells. They had uh, an increase in lymphocyte proliferation 
Um, and what's really important to, or what's really interesting, I think, is that exercise appears to be most beneficial for patients who have got compromised immune function to begin with. So, and if you imagine this on a scale of one to 10 and like 10 is super healthy, never get a cold, and one is getting everything going, you got really, really low immunity then clearly if you're on that bottom end of the scale and you exercise, you're going to see more benefit than if you're already up at the top of the scale. Um, and that's just why it, it just seems to be more beneficial for patients who have that compromising function. So I mentioned that we're having a move towards prescribing, well, movement as medicine, exercise as medicine. And there's a really good resource I want to point you to called movingmedicine.ac.uk. This is hyperlinked in the slide. So, um, and actually just go to movingmedicine.ac.uk. You can find it there. Um, and there's some really good resources for people who work with cancer patients, but also for the general public or, and patients themselves, uh, where, where there's um, infographics that break down nice and easy to understand way. There are conversation starters as well for if you have maybe just you know one or two minutes to chat to a patient before you have to go and see somebody else, things that you can start the conversations with. And then if you've maybe got five minutes or more, you can have a more in-depth conversation. So it's a really handy resource that I definitely recommend. So in terms of, so we know there is a benefit for exercise, but how much should we do? So the current recommendations are actually the same as they are for the general population enemy. Um, and these come from the American College of Sports Medicine, the ACSM, and they are pretty much the gold standard on um, what is what is what we should be doing. The, the last update was published in 2019, so I believe we're due another update soon, but I don't imagine it will change because it was the same as the last one before that. Uh, so the recommendations are to participate in 150 to 300 minutes per week of moderate intensity exercise. So that breaks down into five 30 to 60 minute bouts, or 75 to 150 minutes per week of vigorous intensity exercise. So that's between five and, uh, sorry, five times 15 to 30 minute bouts. Now, clearly, if you are undergoing chemotherapy or even just the side effects of cancer alone, this might be quite difficult to do. Even this is going to be difficult to do, the moderate intensity. So my, um, my own take on this is to be led by your body and listen to your body and, you know, rest before you think you need to rest because um, the effects can be delayed. Um, this infographic is also taken from the ACSM um, website, but just wants to highlight this bit here. So we've got really strong evidence to support the use of aerobic and resistance and in both in combination exercise to reduce cancer-related fatigue, improve quality of life, improve physical functioning and return to normal physical function. We have um, strong evidence for aerobic exercise in um, reducing anxiety and depression and strong evidence for resistance exercise to reduce lymphedema which is often a problem particularly with breast cancer um, uh, post, post um, mastectomy. So certain things as I said will affect a person's ability to exercise, the type and stage of cancer that they have, whether they've had to have surgery, um, the type of treatment they've had, uh, stamina is, is affected, their ability to go for a long time, strength, physical function and uh, fitness level, these are all going to be affected uh, by the different types of, and, and stage of cancer that they have. So I say it's really important to listen to your own body. You know your own body yourself better than any doctor would say to you, yes, follow the recommendations, but also just listen to yourself first. If you're feeling you're, you're fatiguing, stop and take a rest before you, you do too much, basically. So exercise can prevent tumours from growing in the first place, but sadly it doesn't shrink existing tumours, but it does slow their growth. It's most beneficial to patients who have got some sort of immunocompromisation. Again, if you're going through chemotherapy, that would, that would compromise your immune system, so it's going to be beneficial there. There's a really good resource at movingmedicine.ac.uk to provide great conversation starters for GPs and allied health professionals, anyone really who works directly with patients. Um, and the current recommendations are five 30 to 60 minutes of moderate intensity exercise each week. Um, but yeah, the outline recommendations are when you return to exercise or to phase in gradual increases in exercise, but don't just go from nothing to run do, doing five 30 minutes a week, uh, phase it in slowly. All right, so thank you very much. If anyone has any questions, I'll um, open up the, I think we had one that came in beforehand. I'm gonna stop sharing my slide just so I can see the chat. Um, but also that's my email address if you need to get in touch there. 
So the, well, the question we had come in beforehand um, was breast cancer patients are told to exercise between two and a half to five hours a week, depending on if it's moderate or vigorous, of course, uh, because it can help to prevent a recurrence and by up to 50%. But we aren't told why exercise is so important in this situation and for this type of cancer. Is it because exercise reduces inflammation or is it something to do with the immune system? Carol, I think it's both, actually. Um, so it does... Um, can I give examples of more? I'll come back to that in a second. So it does uh, reduce chronic inflammation. So, well, and one single acute bout of exercise will give you a spike in inflammatory factors. But when you train over a long period of time, so six to eight weeks and beyond, then you become trained, if you like. Um, this actually lowers your inflammation overall. Uh, but also, as I said, and as I mentioned earlier, it mobilizes your immune cells. So these help and it helps to help them kill off the cancer cells that you have. Linda asks, can you give examples of moderate intensity exercise? Yeah, I mean, walking at a, quite, at a pace where you're slightly out of breath and you're breaking a sweat. Like if you're meandering through the shops, it's still low, I say that low intensity exercise, but moderate intensity exercises where you're kind of somewhere between like 50 to 60% of your maximum heart rate, for example. So get that, get the blood pumping, get a bit of sweat, keep the sweat going, a little bit out of breath. But you can still hold a conversation that I would say is moderate intensity exercise. Could be cycling, could be running, could be walking, could be gardening even is pretty intense at times depending on what you're doing. So Rebecca asks, do you think that there has been an increase in cancer as we've become less active in general in life? Yes, jo e.g. jobs have become more sedentary and things like washing clothes is now done by a machine. Absolutely. So there is a really interesting, I don't even remember when it was published or who wrote it, but I'll just say a paper um, that talks about the fact that particularly over the last 50 years, we have seen, so like from an evolutionary perspective, we evolved to become more active and those that were active one like lived we, we could run away from the bear that was chasing us right um but then over the last 50 years particularly we've gone away from manual labor jobs to more kind of office-based jobs more sedentary jobs and we are more sedentary we watch more television than we ever had we've got more things to entertain us that don't involve physically moving um and actually that has seen an acceleration in lots of diseases actually but yes cancer incidence has definitely gone on the rise but it's not just about that there is also we know we're exposed to many more toxins. Our food is much more, well, we have more easy access for, to cheap, not very nutritious foods, which would also increase your risk as well. And, and also obesity, Our, we're seeing like the highest levels of obesity ever. And obesity is one of the biggest risk factors for cancer. So, so yeah, good question. Uh, Philip, I assume much of the evidence is from adult cohorts. Oh, can we apply these findings directly to pediatric patients? What might be different as their work looking at this? Yes, the evidence that we've taken is from adult cohorts, you're absolutely right. Um, there, is, uh, there are a few studies looking at pediatric patients. There are less, definitely less. Um, I think part of the issue is a lot of pediatric cancers are things like, um, like leukemias. Um, and yeah, um, I, I don't know off the top of my head, but and that's not something we're doing. But I know that a lot of the, the studies or some of the studies that I know of and can think of are looking at things like quality of life rather than, uh, you know, preventing cancer. Um, Linda, can exercise benefit neutrophils during chemotherapy? What do you mean by benefit neutrophils? You do get an increase in your neutrophil number, if that's what you mean. Um, maybe clarify if I haven't answered that properly. Uh, Tony, removal of hormones by treatment makes it much harder to exercise. Removal of hormones by treatment makes it harder to exercise. Any thoughts on how best to cope with exercise in those circumstances? I don't know. How, in what sense does it make it harder to exercise? Is it it's more exhausting? Because you Is that what you mean? If you could clarify, that would help. Um, Naomi, does running specifically increase NK cells compared to other exercise types? Um, mm, no. It's not, 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 not any less or more so than, say, cycling, for example, or even just walking, actually. Are there the same benefits for male and females? Ooh, good question. I don't know, actually. I don't think anyone's actually picked out those differences. Um, I imagine it's going to be the similar effects, like biologically what's going on inside of us. Um, obviously, we may have different cancers. Um, and, of course, there's the hormone element to it as well. For example, with breast cancer, if it's particularly a hormone-based breast cancer. Hmm. I don't know. Good question, though. Uh, Tony, 
Removal of testosterone equals lower muscle mass and weight gain plus fatigue. Okay, thank you, that helps. Um, so you basically have sarcopenia essentially with muscle wasting um, and weight gain, and then it makes you more fatigued. In that case, I would say you would probably be recommended to do some resistance-based exercise, something that will build the muscle. Um, probably go for lower weights rather than, and more reps rather than higher weights and lower reps, if that makes sense. Um, and in terms of fatigue, I mean, the evidence is there that it does help improve fatigue, global fatigue. Um, but yeah, and I totally get it as a catch-22 because you're exhausted, so you don't want to exercise and therefore you don't, and therefore you get more exhausted. But yeah, um, it is hard, but like little and often rather than going full, full pelt. Diane, neutrophils usually low after chemo and targeted drugs can exercise help to increase them. Yes, it can. Yes, it can. Carol, thanks for answering my free question. <laughs> it was interesting that you mentioned that exercise can help maintain chemo dose. My surgeon mentioned that those who um, exercise have better outcomes to chemo. Yes, I wonder if exercise might help delay the adverse effects that would make oncologists, yes, reduce the dose. For example, weight loss, low neutrophil count, really nasty side effects. Personally, I was on taxane, grim, yeah, and somehow managed to maintain the dose. Did you exercise throughout that? It's really interesting. Um, yeah, so I think that is part of it. I think, um, it improves the response so you can you can you know you, what you are given is going to be more effective uh, but it also allows you to be able to withstand a higher dose so it's going to be even more effective again um i think delay this adverse side effects well i guess it, it's, it would in theory um delay weight loss for example if you're building muscle at the same time um it, it should mobilize your neutrophils um, and in terms of other nasty side effects, I'm assuming you're meaning things like nausea. Um, I don't know about nausea, actually, but it does seem to um, benefit in terms of lots of the other side effects. Linda, to continue treatment, neutrophils have to be over one. Does regular exercise boost them? Yes, it does, but I don't know by how much. Uh, Maria, are you planning on profiling that blood secretome to understand a bit more about what could be happening in the tumours and why they could be reduced? Subject to funding, yes. <laughs> we'd love to. Um, yeah, yeah, we'd love to. But watch this space. Uh, Diane, the literature on cancer and exercise is really fragmented. Is there a source that you could recommend which perhaps patients could show to oncologists and or receive some guidance on what forms to do? Yeah, go to the American College of Sport Medicine website. Uh, or moving medicine and they will have um, really good advice in terms of it's not quite exercise prescription level but they do have really good sound advice on how much and what to do and when we send out the link to the recording for this session we can put those links um Fab. links in it so everyone should receive that on email if that's helpful brilliant thank you you're welcome I mean, you've done a pretty fantastic job there, Vary, of uh, hosting your own Q&A session. Um, if anyone does have any further questions, um, if you could pop them into the chat now, or do feel free to raise your hand if you'd rather sort of have a, a conversation question. Um, but yeah, I'll thank just you very much. Give it. Yeah, I think. I don't think we've got any more. Um, questions coming in at the moment so I think we might wrap it up there if there's no more questions um yeah just for me to say thank you very much Vari for that talk it was very very interesting um we have recorded tonight's session and we will make the recording available over the next couple of days so everyone will receive an email letting them know um when that's available to view uh, or share with any colleagues but yeah Brilliant. thank you everyone for coming and hopefully join us for again for another public lecture soon and thanks very much Vari. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.